guys, Christian Bichev uh, here and welcome to episode 5 of my harmonic geometry video series. And today it's a lesson I wanted to cover a very interesting concept I really like practicing, especially to prepare my hand for a very balanced harmonic sound, uh, big stretches, independence of the fingers, uh, you know, kind of the balance between the different voices that we can play as guitar players. Uh, and this is something that comes from classical music, uh, it has to do with counterpoint. Uh, especially taking two-part inventions and trying to adapt them to a diatonic system where we transpose and see how those voices can move through each one of the modes of different scales and uh, their application, especially in if we're playing improvised music like jazz and how we can use some of those ideas to benefit our melodic and harmonic playing. So let me show you what I mean by this. Uh, I'm going to take an excerpt from uh, Johann Sebastian Bach's two-part inventions this is something I like doing, even though I'm not classically trained, I love checking out classical material and trying to, you know, use it as a reinforcement to, to the skill set that we need as a jazz musicians. Uh, but basically I'm going to take a line, which is a little bit of a mild variation of one of the opening measures of the first two-part invention uh, that Bach wrote, and um, it goes something like this. <laughs> script it's slightly different line I've changed it a little bit to adapt it to my own style of playing and essentially I'm going to extract just that one measure um, and see how we can use this information in any one of its uh, way shapes or forms uh, to open a few doors for us as improvisers so the first thing is we're going to analyze the line it comes from the key of C major and then I would encourage you to figure out which scale shape pattern mode that you use, that you're very uh, comfortable with, does this fit into? For me, this fits as part of the Aeolian pattern that I use in my own system. So for me, all this in the C major scale, what my fingers are doing to play the counterpoint line, it's all I would play finger-wise if I was playing something in Aeolian. Now I start on the melody note, then I go down a fifth and an octave, so we can call this a twelfth interval. Once I go down a twelfth interval, then the notes move diatonically, so they're all stepwise. So you start a starting note, down a twelfth, then stepwise, a step up, step up, and then we're gonna finish one more step up. And from that step, we're going to go a 11th higher. Now, once we go down the 11th, then I'm going to go down a step, back to that note, up a step in the scale. So, And once that happens, the last bass motion is going to go from that note we finished. I'm going to go all the way down to a D. So that's a seventh and an octave, it's going to be a fourth and interval, down, and from that note the bass is going to go a step up, a third down, and a step down. So, a fourth and down, step up, third down, step down, and now it's going to go a fifth higher, this happens to be a diminished fifth in the key from B to, C, uh, B to F. And the last melody goes stepwise down, stepwise down. So again, the entire line I've analyzed intervallically. That's one way of doing things. So I can understand exactly how does it fit within the shape I'm going to be thinking a bit about. The other way of doing things is to figure out in your fingering, if I have a three note per string fingering like I like to use, playing the first column of notes, second column of notes, or third column of notes in the respective string. That's another way I like to analyze things. It's a very easy way. You can see it much faster than intervals. But essentially I'm thinking I'm playing the third column of note on the second string, third column of notes on the sixth string, first column of notes, second column of notes on the fifth string, and then third column of notes on the fifth string. Then it's going to go to a two, one, two, three, and then one, two, three, two, two, one, two. So I can put the 
those numbers, those numbers are pretty much designed to tell me within the architecture of my scale, am I playing notes in the first column on the respective string? Am I playing notes in the middle column or second column as they call it on the respective strings or on the third column of the string? So both ways are also defined. There's many, many other ways that we can uh, use to analyze information. The important thing is to have a very solid understanding as to how this initial line is constructed. Now, once we have that, we're going to now start to have some fun with the, with the material. The first thing to do is make sure when you're executing it, the most important thing that is working on the stretches and on the sustain. So if this note is sustaining, the other ones are moving without that stopping. Then as this note is going to sustain, this finger should stay down so that you hear that sustain. And then when the pink is placed, everything else is up, the pink stays, the line continues, and then when you move the fingers. So again, technically spend some time to make sure there is no space, everything is overlapping nice and easy. Once we have the technical master and we're happy with the sound, the first exercise I'm going to present to you is to move this diatonically through the entire key in every position by retaining the same intervallic structure that the original line has. So if I was going to move this one position higher, still with the same key, basically in my thinking from Aeolian, I'm going to go to Locrian. is I took every single one of the notes that we were playing in the original line and went one note higher in the respective key. So again, we started on a G, now that went to an A. The bass started on a C, now it is going to start on a D. Right? So the idea is to be able to see that relationship in every mode in a very fluid, real-time thinking. So I can play the line in the original mode and then move it. one position higher. So now in my uh, personal interpretation of this material, I'm thinking this is going to be my Ionian box. So now I'm going to play it here. Right? And then I'm going to move one position higher and we're going to go to what they consider the Phrygian box of the, of the scale. Sorry, the Dorian box, not the Phrygian one. I had it myself. So now after C Ionian, we have the Dorian. And then I'm going to move into the Phrygian box of my key, which is based on this fingering. So here's I'm in Phrygian. And then I'm going to move into Lydian, which will be this box. Again, it's just it's different, different set of key signature, different set of intervals diatonically depending on where in the key you start. Now I'm going to move to Lydian in the first position, simply because the stretches are slightly larger than up here, and also that serves as a better purpose as an exercise to, uh, especially when we have to maintain those notes like this, and stretch without losing the bass, and then without losing the melody, right? It's a pretty tough uh, stretch here. So I'm going to use this fingering. This one uh, requires some big stretches because you start with the third finger and you have other notes with the fourth and first. Sebastian Bach two party inventions came from.
So now let me play the entire key of C major on all six strings uh, using this uh, two part invention motif from Johann Sebastian Bach and see how that sounds. So you get the idea now, it's a great exercise, again, when you practice, practice super slowly, uh, tuning every single independent voice, and especially the most important thing in this exercise is making sure those notes who have, the, those fingers who have the sustained notes, excuse me, are actually sounding very clearly and you can hear them very audibly. So the, that sustained note is there, when the bass is moving, then the bass sustains, highest note sustains, bass sustains. Especially when you get to some of the harder notes, like when you do Lydia, and that's hard to do, and holding this note in particular, when we do the melody, it's pretty tough. Or Miss Lydian, which starts on the third finger, and you have to surround it and hold this. So that's the main idea. Now, once you have the major key, I'll definitely encourage you to go through every single scale and all of its modes that you are using in your own style of music. Uh, particularly, some of my workouts really consists of melodic minor and major scales on the seven note scales, and then I do a lot of pentatonic workouts as well. But for my personal style of playing, I will then take this lick and try to do it in melodic minor using exactly the same logic. I'm analyzing what's happening harmonically and melodically at the interval structure, but I'm also analyzing what's happening on the actual uh, system that I'm using. How does this fit with some of the, the abstract logic, with some of the, uh, the almost geometrical way that you can, or visual way you can approach a guitar as well, to have a stronger reference point. And so if I take now this same line and move it in melodic minor, well, C melodic minor and C major differ only in one note. So the only note that's going to change is really if there's an E, it's going to become an E flat. Everything else is going to stay the same. Uh, but again, I want to think about the modes and how I fit within this. So from this shape for C major, now this becomes the sixth mode of melodic minor. So if I transpose that same intervallic structure and the same um, kind of geometrical structure in that mode, now it's going to turn into this. And so once I have that, now I'm going to turn that into a workout again to practice melodic minor, maybe on a different day, I will use the same line, and now I'm going to move it to all the modes of melodic minor and see how that moves throughout the fretboard that tonically changing the interval but staying in the same key and the same intervallic uh, proportions. So for me, if I start on this position, I'm thinking I'm in the box of the sixth mode of melodic minor based on A, and so that line is going to look like this. Now when I move one position higher, I'm thinking I'm in the box of B super locrium, which is the seventh mode. And so the line transforms to this. Then when I go one position higher, I'm going to be in the C melodic minor scale by the number one. That's the first mode. And so it's going to go like this. Higher, 
I'm in the second mod of uh, melodic minor starting on D, which is this shape. So that intervallic structure now is going to look like this. higher now I'm going to be in the third mode of semi-melodic minor which does an E flat and the particular motif is going to transpose like this So again, one position higher, we're going to be in the F uh, Lydian dominant, which is the fourth mode of C melodic minor. And so now the line here would look like this. This is a great workout because of all the stretching. One position higher, we finally get into the fifth and last mode that we haven't used of the semi-melodic minor scale, and this starts on G and it's called a mixolydian flat 13. And here the transposition it's really hard personally for me because the fingering is very awkward, uh, but uh, if we move it, it will sound something like this. we started, which was the Porter's transposition. So another great exercise I love practicing is pretty much taking the same motif, but this time instead of moving it horizontally on the fretboard and covering exactly the same key signature, but through all its positions uh, and all its areas on the fretboard, I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to stay in one position only physically, but move through all 12 key signatures of whatever system I'm working. So if I was going to do this with major scales, and I'll start on C, I'll try to visualize, without moving my hand from here, how would all the other major keys with their key signatures look if this motif has been transposed through them. And so for that purpose, I usually like doing cycles of fourths. Uh, that's a great exercise to, you know, really put a very proportional way to go through the keys. You can also do cycles of fifths or any other cycle you desire, chromatically, whatever the case might be. But the idea is this, once I see the motif in C, now played in F, then played in B flat, cycles of fourths and, and being able to in real time think about how does a uh, melodic unit, so something that's a, uh, you know, a melody, a harmony or a two, two different melodies in this uh, section, how do they move through key signatures, how do they evolve, how do they change, what happens, how do they transform uh, in real time. That's, I think it's a great skill for your brain um, and something that really can help in improvisation. Now, once you have covered this, and hopefully by practicing this as part of your daily routine and just as a warm-up stretching coordination exercise, the same way as you practice scales, um, eventually you're going to develop enough muscle memory where your hands and fingers will be able to do these motions, where one finger sustains 
the other are moving around, then another finger sustains, the, the, the rest are moving. And so then finally I think this is going to start showing up in your playing in a completely different format, different manner. So let me show you how this can be applied to something that as a jazz player you might uh, need to do on a daily basis. If I take a 2-5-1 progression, D minor, G, and C, uh, what I can do is once I have the muscle memory, if I play my D minor chord, I might be able to do something like this. I'm staying the same motion and applying it to whatever mode I see for the D minor chord to create a more of a counter puncture type of movement on the fretboard instead of just playing block voicing. So again, I'm taking a voicing, adding a different melody note that sustains, then the bass is moving to the key and then a few other notes. Or So again, you, you can apply the same type of structure. It's not, I'm not transposing the, our initial melody note for note or uh, same intervallic structure. I'm just taking the same motion, the basics. Once that has been ingrained in your muscle memory, you're going to find yourself playing things like this. And I'm going to do it over a G7. Now for G7, I'm altering the chord. And so my mind is switching right away to see all the notes in A flat melodic minor, which is the parent scale that contains a G altered chord. And so then I can start seeing these notes in that particular mode, right? And so maybe a motion that I can do. So again, I took a voicing, and then as the melody note is sustaining, I'm gonna move my bass. And then the melody moves. So I'm mimicking the same motion we did here. Minor system over a voicing. And then we'll result to a C major, which has a highest note that I'm going to use as the basis for my melody, and then maybe move the pattern. So maybe. Again, I'm completely improvising this now, also, whatever my fingers are seeing. So I have a voicing that I use as the first note that has a highest note that sustains. Against that, I'm moving a bass within a pattern of the scale that I see under my fingers. Then that bass becomes a new sustaining note, and then a melody moves on top. So maybe then I can end up with a 2 5 one progression that textually sounds something like this. for watching and I hope this concept uh, might uh, give you a few more ideas as to how you can approach your own practice sessions and your own practice routines and also as to new textures and new uh, things to implement into your playing and the way you approach uh, uh, the guitar. But thank you so much for watching again and I look forward to seeing you in our next video.